is Your Life, a program for all America. Brought to you by New Green Comet Cleanser, the only cleanser fortified with Chlorinol. Comet bleaches out stains, wipes out germs as no other leading cleanser can. Get New Comet and Crest Toothpaste with Floristan. And now here he is, Mr. This is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. Good evening and welcome to This is Your Life, everybody. I'm standing in our TV control room here in California. And uh, here in my hand is the first radio tube, the miracle seed from which sprang the entire mighty structure of radio and television, sonar, radar, talking pictures, guided missiles, automation, the electric brain computer and long distance telephone communication. This tube was the creation of one great man who at this moment is seated on our stage. Now, he did not hear or see our regular opening to our program. He believes he's here to appear uh, on a special program of NBC's Department of Special Events. Now, Bob Warren is ready to make this great man believe that we are just now switching this special program to California. So please cue Bob Warren. You stay seated. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the television audience, I'm happy to introduce one of the greatest inventors who ever lived, Dr. Lee DeForest. <laughs> you sit down, Dr. DeForest. And take a look at this television screen right here before you. We're going to take you now to New York City, and from there, a friend will speak to you, a man who, in his own garage in Montclair, New Jersey, perfected the cathode ray tube, which did so much to give us this miracle of television. Here is the chairman of the board of Dumont Television, Dr. Alan B. Dumont. Hello, Dr. DeForest. I went to work for you as a young engineer in 1928. Together, you and I built the first television transmitter for simulcasting sight and sound. What inspiration you gave me, teaching me to search on and on that the answer could be found. You are a giant figure in our century. Your invention of the audio tube opened the doors to the fabulous future world of radio, television, radar, and a hundred other miracles. Had it not been for you, we could not see or speak to you, as I am now doing across the continent. I congratulate you, and I now wish to surprise you by having you meet your host, Ralph Edwards. Good to see you, sir. I know. He came in live from New York just then. Thank you, Bob Warren. You know, I'm here, as you've probably guessed by now, Dr. DeForest, that to tell you, Dr. Lee DeForest, tonight, this is your life. <laughs> I'm glad it makes you happy, sir. I assure you, it thrills us. This is a night when we reveal a life of breathless excitement, when marvels happen for the first time in history. We'll begin that excitement in just a moment. Right now, sir, please sit down, take a breath. We'll be right with you. Now, a message about wonderful new Comet Cleanser. This charming older home was bought by the Wilsons of Cleveland. Mrs. Wilson loved the house, except for that old stained sink. She rubbed and rubbed, tried so many cleansers. She thought she'd have to get a new sink. Then she discovered Comet, Procter & Gamble's completely new kind of cleanser. That did it. Only Comet is fortified with chlorinol to give you the most effective form of chlorine bleach. She was amazed. Every stain was gone. That sink looked almost like new again. What's more, Comet kills up to 99% of household germs, important where you prepare foods. So if you can't get a new sink right now, get new Comet. Comet gets any sink, old or new, cleaner and whiter than ever before possible with any cleanser. Comet bleaches out stains, wipes out germs, as no other leading cleanser can. Now, Dr. Lee DeForest of Council Bluffs, Iowa, father of radio, grandfather of television, 
Let's follow your star of destiny, sir, back to its first light, shall we? Yeah. This is your well, life. Wonderful, wonderful. It's summertime in Council Bluffs, Iowa, 83 years ago. They had no such rockets as that one on our screen that we just saw now on the 4th of July that year. But that summer, you're born a boy who will make such wonders commonplace. Your mother was Anna Roberts. Your father, descendant from the forests who came to America as early as uh, 1636, wasn't it? That's right. Father was pastor of the First Congregational Church. When you're six, he is called to a life of great dedication to direct a college for Negroes at Talladega, Alabama. That's right. Our parents took Lee and our brother Charles and myself to a strange new life in Alabama. Well, now that's the first voice out of your past, sir. It's your sister. For years, you two have wanted to be reunited from St. Petersburg, Florida, wife of the Reverend Philip Ralph. Here's your sister, Mary. <laughs> I recognize your voice. <laughs> yes. How did Lee get along down there in the South, Mrs. Rao? Well, it was so near the close of the Civil War that there were still strong feelings among the Southerners. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and sometimes they threw rocks at the damned Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> you were from Cascades, you were... I'm shocked to hear you use that word. <laughs> oh, it's a colloquialism. There's a play called that, you know. They tried to open your shirts and find out whether you had blue bellies one time. <laughs> and, well, here's a fellow who can attest to that. Dr. Elisha Jones of Talladega, Alabama. <laughs> How are you? Oh, oh, finally, how are I'm you? So glad, glad to, to see you. you. I'm glad to Great see you. Uh, I bring you greetings from Dr. Gray, the first Negro president of Talladega College. Well, thank you very much. You remember, Lee, I used to help you mow the lawn. You often sneaked off to the swimming hole. <laughs> that rock that we used to use in jumping off into Talladega Creek is still there with your name engraved. <laughs> that, of course, was before you became a physician, Dr. Jones, right? Uh, come on over here, doctor, so we can get uh, Mary in here, sister, too. Uh, as young as 10 or 12, you, Dr. DeForest, were constantly drawing or making mechanical things, weren't you, sir? Oh, yes, indeed. What did you make? Model locomotives? A lo locomotive that wouldn't move and a uh, <laughs> ha hand car that did move. Yes, but <laughs> most of all, as you roam the beautiful woods and streams of Alabama, your heart is set on being an inventor. No, always. Thank you, Mrs. Philip Ralph of St. Petersburg, Florida, Sister Mary, and Dr. Elisha Jones of Talladega, Alabama. You'll see your pal a little later. <laughs> At 16, you put a respectful letter on your father's desk asking him to let you go to Sheffield Scientific School at Yale University. That's right. To earn your way in preparatory school, you worked in the fields, didn't you? Yes. What'd you do there, sir? At the school? No, sir, in the fields. You planted potatoes, dug potatoes, oh, and things like that? Oh, in the school, I had to dig potatoes. Yes, indeed. What job did you get that summer at the World's Exposition in Chicago? I was a chair pusher. Little do you dream that 11 years later, at the World's Exposition in St. Louis, the name of Lee de Forest will blaze from the tallest towers there. Your beloved father dies while you're at Yale, creating even greater financial problems for you. Yes. Yes. One night you work late in the laboratory of Winchester Hall. In the same building, an important le lecture is taking place. You remember this, don't you? The hall full of Yale professors and dignitaries. What did you do that got you into such a peck of trouble there, Dr. DeForest? I was playing down and doing some experimental work down in the basement. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever I did blew the fuses <laughs> in the building. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and And the, the audience was in total blackness. They had to dismiss them by candlelight. <laughs> And they dismissed me by daylight the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> At 25, you win your PhD degree. You've read everything about Marconi and his first device for wireless telegraphy. You're so certain you can do better 
can make wireless a practical reality that twice you quit jobs and live on $5 a week donated by friends to spend your time in endless experiments. That's right. With your clothes in tatters, <coughs> shoes run down, and last meal ticket punched out, you stand one night in the rain on top of the Lakota Hotel in Chicago. And from how far away did you receive a signal through your new wireless detector? The signal's from Armour Institute, about th th three miles. Years uh, of bleak poverty, but blazing excitement passed. Oh. Now you're sending and receiving signals seven miles, and then 20 miles, and then 100 miles. At the St. Louis World's Fair, Doc and I sent a message 300 miles. A voice you haven't heard since the year 1906. Now, this is over 50 years ago. Here from Palm Harbor, Florida, is your wireless buddy, whom you haven't seen in 50 years, Mr. Harry Pop Ather. How are you? Good. Yes, I'm glad to see you again. So uh, was. I'm so glad to know you're alive, boy. There were some doubting Thomases, uh, among the officials at the St. Louis World's Fair, weren't there, Mr. Hathorne? Yes, there were, but Doc convinced them, and Doc, <laughs> they gave you the grand prize gold medal. That's right. The highest honor That's of right. the fair. And then in that same year, 1904, you thrilled the world again with history's first use of wireless in war. That's yes. right. And you, you were one of the men that did it. You were the one, that were, the two that went to, took the wireless telegraph to... Uh, why, why? Yes. In, uh, and put it on the, the, the yacht. The, the great English war reporter, Lionel James. Yes, uh, Lionel uh, James. Met uh, you at that time. And what did you persuade him to do with your uh, new wireless sets, Dr. DeForest? Well, we, he happened to be on the ship that we were going back to from uh, Liverpool to New York. Yes. And uh, the president was on that ship, too. And <laughs> my, my operator, Har Horton, was, was with me. We made a point to be with Lionel James all the time so that Fessenden could not get to him. <laughs> and we told him, we told him the story that what we could do for him in reporting the... Uh, the in covering the, uh, the Russo-Japanese Russo war. Russo-Japanese war, where he was going over to do. Well, you made that trip, Mr. Athern, so tell us the way Dr. DeForest's wireless uh, sets made more history. Well, I had a set on board a chartered steamer, and Admiral Togo's fleet was not far away searching for the Russians. We sighted the Russian fleet, and it said that in our messages to shore, the Japanese were able to find the Russians. And then Admiral Togo performed the classic maneuver of crossing the T and sank that Russian fleet. Well, thank you, Mr. Harry uh, Athern of Palm uh, Harbor, wonderful. Florida. What a thrill to have made history's first world news scoop by wireless. That's right. <laughs> Today, the lean gray men of war of the U.S. Navy search the seas by radar, thanks to you, Dr. DeForest. Back as far as these years of 1902 to 1904, the Navy encourages you. Yes, indeed. The Navy was my best friend from the very beginning. I was, I was with Dr. DeForest when he uh, risked his life against yellow fever to set up the first Navy wireless stations in Cuba and Panama. And I was present when Dr. DeForest invented the audion tube, the greatest invention in the era of electronics. This, sir, from Paradise, California, is Mr. B. F. Greaves, whom you haven't seen in 15 years. And from Mineola, Long Island, your associate of many years, Mr. E. N. Pickerel. So glad to see you, Pickerel. Here in 1904, the, uh, come on up, gentlemen, and uh, stand by the doctor. Uh, let's put him in the middle so we can really get him. Uh, you know, we don't want to play any favorites here. They <laughs> both are tremendously fond of you, of course. Here in 1904, the Panama Canal is being dug. What risks you and Dr. DeForest take in setting up those first uh, historic wireless stations for the Navy? We'll find out in a moment, gentlemen. And we'll relive other thrills, such as how the world reacted to history's first...